Let us prepare our hearts for worship and follow along in the bulletin, if you will. In the past, God spoke through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Praise the Lord. Amen. Exodus 12, 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. 
Do not leave any of it until morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a fasting ordinance. Stand as you're able to uh, page 287, first verses, uh, verse 1 and 3. <laughs> reading here comes from the book of Exodus chapter 19 verses 1 through 6. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole world is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Our third reading is God's will for his people. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 1 through 21. Moses summoned all of Israel and said, Hear, Israel, the decrees and laws that I declare you are hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Oreb. It was not with our ancestors that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. 
At that time, I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the word of the Lord, because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up to the mountain. And then he said, I, and, and the Lord said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make... You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children <coughs> excuse me, for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses my name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no, not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that male and female servants may rest as well. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may be, may be well with you in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or on his land his male or female servant, his ox or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Let's stand as you're able to page 295. We'll sing the first and fifth verse. <laughs> fourth reading is from Matthew 26, 26 through 30. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives.
God be the glory, great things he has done. We're, we're here this evening to commemorate and remember the Last Supper for Jesus uh, here on earth. But in many ways, it's the first time that we come to the table. It's the first time we recognize the supper at the Lord's table. It was the Passover. Jesus and his disciples had gathered in a room to share a meal. It was customary and an expected act of hospitality to have someone wash their feet who, who, as the visitors come in. And, uh, but there was no servant present at that time. And so the disciples were still on a power trip. I can imagine them talking and discussing when Jesus made this grand entry. They recognized the political power of Jesus. So these disciples would have been very much on a power trip uh, following Palm Sunday. They were busy trying to figure out which cabinet positions they were going to uh, get in the new government. They were thinking about setting up Jesus' governing body. They were somebody now. Finally, they were somebody in that society. They would never think of themselves to lowering themselves to this menial task of washing feet. So Jesus took a basin and a towel, and he began to wash the feet of the disciples. They would have been embarrassed. They would have been embarrassed to do what no one was willing to do. It was, if, if they weren't embarrassed, they should have been. When Jesus got to Peter, Peter couldn't take it. He said, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. Don't you know how difficult that would have been for Peter to accept this act of humility and service from the one who considered to be so much greater than himself? I mean that this, this was Jesus Christ kneeling down in the dirt to be a servant to the disciples. Peter resisted, but Jesus said, if I do not wash your feet, you'll have no part of me. Most of what we talk about in that event was the act of humble service that, that Jesus rendered. But in fact, he asked him later, do you not understand what I've done for you? I've given you an example. You should do one to one another as I have done to you. This is how people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. With the basin and the towel, Jesus gave them as an example of servant love. Later at the cross, he gave us the gift of suffering love. And that's what we usually emphasize, these two loving events. But there's another truth in the midst of all this we cannot miss. When Peter resisted Jesus' gift of servant love, Jesus said, if I do not wash your feet, you'll have no part of me. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? He was saying that the willingness and ability to receive is essential to a relationship. If Peter refused to allow Jesus to give him something, they could have no meaningful relationship. Re relationship requires giving and receiving. I've said for many years, if you're not prepared to receive, you're not prepared to give. Most people love to give of themselves. They love the joy of knowing they've done something special for another person. We get that fluttery feeling when we feel like we can help somebody along the way. But I'm here to tell you, we must be gracious receivers of the grace of God. For unless you have received it, you have nothing to give. It's absolutely vital in our Christian walk that we be renewed and refreshed daily in God's spirit. Otherwise, we get drained. When we give so much of ourselves and we fail to receive the rich blessings of God, you're not an island unto yourself. You do not have it within yourself. Though we deceive ourselves at times, you do not have it in yourselves to live a holy and godly life apart from the power of God. So the fact is, unless we, re we first have received, our lives are not vast uh, re reservoirs of inexhaustible gifts for other people. Our lives are just not built that way. Our supply of love, of caring, and helpfulness and all the other gifts are limited. And we will exhaust our supply unless we're continually restocking. The Bible reminds us that we love because he first loved us. What that scripture is saying, that whatever loving or giving that we Christians are able to do is the result of receiving from God. We simply become a channel to pass the love and grace of God through us 
to others. And we can be sure that we'll, we'll soon run out of good things to give unless we continually receive. Psychologists tell us that we're incapable of loving other people unless we're first loved. Unless we have experienced it, we cannot know what it is. We must receive it and we can pass it on. So together around Jesus' table, we come to receive the body and the blood of Jesus today. That you may be prepared to offer the world the love and the grace of God in Jesus' name. How grateful we are for this family meal that God has prepared for us. Most gracious God, as we gather around this table, that we might be open to receiving the gift of God's love, that we might share the bounty of heaven. Let us nourish when we feel depleted. That sustains us when times are difficult. Comfort us when we're sorrowful. Enhance Enhance our gifts, enhance our joys, enhance until the cups overflow. Let it be that that meal we share will enable us to nurture others through the gift of the bread of life. And for this bread and wine we share, we are truly thankful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As we uh, gather around the table, I want to remind you just a one little uh, quick thing about the exit. Uh, once communion is, is finished, uh, we'll be uh, removing this stuff. So I ask you to remain seated and we'll follow the choir out uh, quietly uh, upon the conclusion of our service. Let us be in the attitude of worship as we come around this table. are created at all things pronounce them good you made human beings in your own image to share your life to reflect your glory in the fullness of time you gave Christ to us as the way the truth and the life in the upper room Christ gave us this supper that we should celebrate the memorial of the cross and resurrection by which he became the source of salvation for all who put their trust in him Therefore, with the whole company of saints in heaven and on earth, with all of creation in all time, we sing a hymn to your glory. We give thanks to God the Father that our Savior Jesus Christ, before he suffered, gave us this memorial of his sacrifice until his coming again. For the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the cup, after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. <coughs> we shall do as our Lord commands. Almighty God, send your spirit upon us, your people, upon this bread and wine, that they to us may be Christ's body and blood. 
that in partaking we may be one single body, one single spirit in Christ, a living sacrifice to the praise of your glory. The bread we break is the sharing of the body of Christ. The cup for which we give thanks is the sharing of the blood of Christ. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. I ask you to come up the, uh, as Sue makes her way forward, I ask you to come to the middle and exit out the, the sides.
Our Lord suffered, died, and was buried. But on the third day, he rose again. Behold, O God, your family, your son Jesus, did not hesitate for its sake to give himself into the hands of wicked people and to suffer agony on the cross. Your son, who now lives and reigns with you in unity with the Holy Spirit, one God now and all forever.